Disruptions on the scale that we've just been hearing about are causing great debates in the boardrooms of international businesses which are reliant on the efficient movement of goods and raw materials. The upending of global supply chains caused by COVID and other global events is spurring an industry-wide awakening that has business leaders eager to create more agile and resilient operations that can withstand future shocks. So what are the trends shaping the future of supply chain resiliency in a post-pandemic world? What lessons have businesses learned from recent disruptions? And what best practices are organizations adopting to build resilient supply chains and create competitive advantages in a post-pandemic world? Well, joining us to share his views on these points is Mirko Wojcik, Global Deputy Head of Everstream Analytics Intelligence Solutions Team which provides around-the-clock supply chain risk monitoring and analytics for the EMEA region. With seemingly more questions than answers for businesses still coming to terms with the so-called new normal, let's hear Everstream's take of what's now unfolding in the supply chain market. So now please go to the Up Next tab and select Mirko's presentation, which is just about to begin, and then click Enter the Room. And just that reminder, there'll just be a minute or so delay before the presentation starts. Mirko, many thanks for being with us. Over to you. Good afternoon from my side. Uh, I'm super thrilled to participate uh, in this year's TAPA EMEA virtual conference uh, and discuss the topic of supply chain resiliency in a, in a post-pandemic world, which will hopefully be soon enough. Uh, my name is Mirko Wojcik. Uh, I'm directing the Global Risk Monitoring Activities at Everstream Analytics, uh, which has recently been formed after the merger of DHL Resilience 360 and Risk Pulse. Um, many of you may be more familiar with uh, DHL Resilience 360, actually, uh, which was incubated as a supply chain risk management platform within Deutsche Post DHL Group. has been a long-standing partner uh, with TAPA EMEA. Uh, we provide our customers with a holistic risk management solution so that they are better able to manage their end-to-end uh, -end supply chain operations and, and take advantage, or take, you know, sort of create a competitive advantage by, by reacting quicker to any disruption in the supply chain. So I would like to start out this session by, by setting the scene and, and talk about where supply chains stand uh, in November 2021, uh, you know, just before, before the, the end of the year. Um, before then also diving a bit deeper into what lessons uh, we should have learned by now from the pandemic so far, and also what trends we are seeing in, in terms of supply chain risk management, and also how our customers have sort of navigated the, the disruptions that have occurred in the, in the past 18 months or so. Um, so, just changing the slide here. Uh, okay, so supply chains have obviously truly been uh, in turmoil ever since the start of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in, in early 2020. Um, both there have been unprecedented shocks uh, on the demand and the supply side. But uh, what you know can, you can clearly forget uh, in all the sort of uh, daily uh, sort of news about uh, ongoing challenges and, and, and new sort of um, risks to, to supply chains at the moment that, you know, Supply chains were really on their path to recovery in early 2021, uh, in an, on a number of for a number of reasons. Um, a number of short-term disruptions have then led to further challenges that uh, eventually uh, have sort of caused uh, disruptions that are you know now sort of will um, probably cause supply chains to be in turmoil for uh, the, the remainder of 2021, but also going well into 2022. So there's sort of the path to recovery has really been sort of stopped. And, and there have been a number of really key disruptions in 2021 that uh, now sort of make any normalization impossible probably before uh, Q2 2022. So I wanna uh, talk a little bit more about what these disruptions were in 2021 and why, why they were so impactful and sort of what they have resulted in to kind of uh, give the picture of where we stand at the moment. extreme uh, weather event, obviously North America in, in, in the early parts of 2021, there has been a winter storm uh, that sort of swept across uh, most of the Southern US 
and that has disrupted uh, key semiconductor plants uh, as well as petrochemical plants in, in Texas and Louisiana. Um, and that event was uh, really a key event because on the one hand, it sort of exacerbated a, a global semiconductor shortage that was already underway at the time. Um, and at the same time, it created new shortages of, of key plastic materials that have been used in, in many, many in, end industries, uh, being it sort of automotive interior, uh, medical fa face shields, uh, or smartphones. So that event alone has caused a number of shortages that are still ongoing uh, in, in November 2021, actually. So really impactful event. Uh, just a month later, uh, on the logistics side, there has been a, a, the closure of the Suez Canal, obviously seven-day closure because of the grounding of the Ever Given, one of the, the biggest container vessels in the world. Uh, and that had no, not only an impact on the immediate sort of uh, maritime operations, obviously uh, more than sort of hundreds of vessels were, were stuck on both sides of the canal uh, because they couldn't pass through. And that's obviously one of the key passage points uh, between Asia and Europe on the maritime, on, for maritime supply chains. Um, but the event obviously lasted for much longer because uh, sort of the delays that occurred um, and, and sort of the congestion that, that uh, sort of the vessel arrival, the concentrated vessel arrivals actually created, especially in European ports, um, you know, have sort of lasted for much longer than just the initial seven day event. And, and even really highly efficient ports such as the port of Rotterdam, port of Antwerp, have obviously you know had to deal with this these this influx of of container ships uh, once the canal reopened and and just continued to to arrive uh, within a short short uh, time period. Another sort of series of events, actually, uh, you have to call it, is was obviously the COVID nineteen outbreaks at at, at key uh, some of the largest ports and and, and airports around the world, uh, mainly mainly in China actually, but also in Hong Kong. Uh, that actually has started in, in, in the month of May. So just two months after the Suez Canal closure, uh, there was an outbreak at the port of Yantian, uh, a key port and a key export hub actually in the south of China. There was sort of uh, shut down for more than two weeks. But then a few months later, also one terminal at the port of Ningbo, one of the biggest, uh, largest uh, container ports in the world, um, was also sort of uh, shut down. Uh, and then you had uh, sort of shutdowns as well at the um, at the airport in Shanghai, but also in Hong Kong, because of these COVID-19 outbreaks and, and ongoing uh, sort of uh, sort of reactions and, and the restrictions that were imposed by by local authorities, all of that actually created uh, further congestion and delays, and at the same time that sort of uh, sort of reduced capacity simply by cutting down flights, cutting down vessel services, both at the ports and airports, and that was met at the same time with strong export volumes into North America and European markets uh, in China. And the result of these strong export volumes and in turn has caused congestion and delays that have spilled over into many, many different ports in, in, in Europe, for example. Uh, we have seen really hyper-efficient gateways uh, such as the port of Antwerp, port of Rotterdam, port of Hamburg that have been specifically called out in, in the latest market update by DHL as being extremely congested and, and sort of really being overwhelmed uh, obviously being met by labor shortages because of uh, COVID-19 and quarantine measures and so on. But yeah, it's really not a, only a phenomenon, phenomenon that sort of affects, uh, you know, ports in, in, in China, but then in turn, uh, then also has an impact on, on ports in, in other parts of the world. And fourth, uh, I really want to talk about also the, um, so the impact of, of a key event that happened uh, again in China, but also in Europe uh, over the past two months is uh, the ongoing sort of power shortages and, and sort of the, the distortions that these have created in global supply chains for the past two months. Uh, in China, uh, hundreds of factories actually had to halt operation, operations because of power cuts uh, that, that were enforced by local authorities. Um, while at the same time in Europe, uh, you had uh, obviously high energy prices that are still ongoing that had a key uh, sort of impact on, on agrochem agrochemical companies. These were forced to shut down operations um, uh, because of these high energy prices and it wasn't just profitable anymore to sort of continue running. Uh, and that in turn uh, has also caused shortages of byproducts of these fertilizers, such as carbon dioxide, which are being used in a, in a variety of, of downstream industries, such as food and beverage, uh, but also the medical industry. So all of these events, really uh, have resulted in, in 
unprecedented supply chain turmoil that has uh, really spread to all parts of the supply chain. Um, and uh, it's not really important whether you're on the logistics side or on the sort of manufacturing and procurement side in, in supply chains. Uh, on the one hand, you have the extreme space constraints and the high transportation costs uh, that are sort of still affecting logistics. And we're gonna talk about that uh, at length today. And on the other side, you have material shortages and high material costs in, in manufacturing and, and retail industries that are also ongoing until, until this point. So to just uh, highlight the impact that these events really have had and where we stand in November, 2021, uh, in terms of sort of the overarching supply chain operations, I just wanna uh, give two examples that really uh, showcase um, you know, the, the, the tremendous impact and really the unprecedented situation that we still find ourselves in. On the one, on the one hand, uh, in ocean freight logistics, you see that impact on global shipping costs, specifically in, this, in the spot market, have skyrocketed and exceeded actually the $10,000 $10, barrier uh, on average across the, the major eight uh, east-west trade lanes in August for the first time, uh, so three months ago. And that's actually 300% higher than, than uh, at the same period in 2020. Um, what has been so remarkable about this is obviously just the, the, the sheer scale of it, but also that it has, you know, after the Suez Canal closure, it really took five months uh, of continuous climbing of, of, uh, of spot rates before eventually that sort of rise was, was stopped uh, in late September, so about six weeks ago, um, and, 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 you know, have, has sort of plateaued out over the last few weeks, we may have reached a peak there, but but just the sheer scale of uh, where we stand at the moment is, uh, you know, would have been unthinkable uh, just two years ago. Now, on the other side, uh, going away from logistics, but more into the sort of uh, material sourcing and, and manufacturing, if you look at material shortages, this, the global semiconductor crunch in 2021 has obviously first and foremost uh, impacted the automotive industry um, for the longest. Uh, they have canceled orders in, in 2020 at the height of the uh, pandemic, um, because obviously factories were shut down, but there was also not a lot of consumer demand for cars. At the same time, you saw that consumer electronics companies actually increased orders for, for semiconductors and chips because of the strong demand for their products during the pandemic. Uh, and so ever since actually car demand has, has increased over the last 12 months, all of the automotive, automotive uh, car makers have struggled to get hold of enough shifts to produce their cars and, and to sort of put these chips into the cars. And we have been repeatedly forced to shut down production lines. Um, and, and in total, the semiconductor shortage is now expected to have cost them in lost revenue about $210 billion. So it's it's just an, an incredible number that I wanted to put out there. Just, you know, obviously as one, one other example that really shows the uh, unprecedented turmoil in, in supply chains that we have reached and has really now spilled over into all industries. At the same time, we see that more and more companies are ready and, and eager to create, you know, to you know, react from this and create more resilient supply chain operations uh, that can sort of withstand, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, future shocks such as the one that we are still living through. Um, so let's have a look at some of the most important lessons uh, learned so far during the pandemic uh, that could potentially help companies to prepare their supply chain operations for 2022 and beyond. So first, uh, the space constraints that I mentioned in, in ocean and air logistics, they're likely to continue well into 2022. Even as we, as I just mentioned, we see that spot rates on the major routes are potentially reaching their peak and not rising, even you know, declining in some weeks and not rising as, as much anymore. Um, why is this? Um, so why will the space constraints continue? This is especially because inventory levels remain low in many parts of the world, um, also connected obviously to the material and supply shortages. So, so sort of creating higher inventory levels is not really possible at the moment, but because you know they remain so low, so low cargo volumes are really only expected to remain strong in the coming month. And at the same time on the supply side, in terms of capacity, if you look at uh, the air freight market, belly capacity has not returned as quickly as expected, also because of ongoing challenges with the COVID-19 variants that are still sort of you know lockdowns here and there and, and ongoing travel restrictions. So overall, air cargo capacity remains about 10% below pre-pandemic levels. 
according to the latest da data from uh, the International Air Transport Association. On, on the other side, on the ocean freight, in the ocean freight market, you have an apparent paradox that is that shipping lines have actually increased uh, the nominal shipping capacity in the last 12 months, but that additional capacity is, is you know, really in reality negligible because of the congestion and the shipping delays that we mentioned before. Uh, to just give one example on the on the Asia North Europe trade lane, typically before all of the carriers had been using about 10 to 11 active container ships to service this 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 route, but now they have actually two or three more ships, uh, uh, so there is more capacity in the market, but that's actually hardly visible because of the yeah, congestion as mentioned. And so. So as this, the space constraints continue, this is also in line with what we see in terms of the latest market outlook from, for example, uh, freight forwarders such as DHL. They expect that ocean rates will further increase in the coming month, despite capacity remaining stable. Uh, we have analyzed uh, the, the 21 major trade lanes actually that they put out, and only about one fifth of all of them, uh, you know, the, the rates are expected to decline or remain stable or actually slightly decline with you know, four fifth actually expected to increase in, in their latest November outlook. So really the logistics costs are unlikely to, to come down anytime soon and, and sort of space constraints are not uh, are unlikely to, to sort of fade away in the, in the next couple of months. At the same time, because of these uh, space constraints, uh, another lesson that, that has been learned is that you know, on the, uh, what you can actually do about it is that accurate forecasting of shipment volumes well in advance uh, has become even more critical. Uh, we've seen that uh, companies and uh, or customers that have done a better job in actually uh, doing these forecasts and, and be more accurate and sort of locking capacity well in advance have been able to secure that capacity uh, much easier and avoid any kind of uh, sort of last minute hiccups or last minute challenges when it comes to especially rolled cargo that we've seen that we've seen in, in both air and ocean freight logistics. Um, Thirdly, and that's especially true when working with a long-term logistics partner, one of the lessons learned is really that forwarders uh, are willing to go the extra mile for long-term existing customers. We've seen customers really struggle when they switched uh, forwarders or, or sort of long-term logis logistics partners because at the moment in a seller's market, uh, you know, really all, all sort of forwarders are doing is really taking care and going the extra mile for their existing customers. And that may, may not really be the case for new customers, even if they're ready to pay extraordinary amounts. Uh, for, for instance, so sort of as, as you know, we see these ocean bottlenecks uh, all around the world, uh, a lot of the forwarders that have actually started this year and will likely continue into 2022 to offer, for example, charter vessels uh, of several hundred TEUs on the big trade lanes for the existing customers to, to you know, sort of bypass uh, sort of these bigger congestion hubs congested hubs and, and really offer extra services, extra loaders for their for their customers to really, you know, sort of, you know, require or sort of uh, be able to match the, the service levels that are that are needed from the customer side. And and fourth, another lesson learned is that uh, it's it continues to be as, as vital to continue to explore alternative or combined modes of transportation for specific routes. Uh, it's not enough to just you know rely on 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 sort of the the routes that you've used in the past or the modes of transportation. Uh, with the turmoil, it's really necessary to explore new things. And one of the things that has really gained a lot of traction uh, is the rail option between China and Europe um, that has become increasingly popular, uh, especially you know at the height of the pandemic uh, in China in in 2020, but has continued only to grow ever since. Uh, what is also on the on the Trans-Pacific lane um, between China and the US, but also on the Trans-Atlantic lane between the US and Europe, we see more and more uh, services being offered in terms of the expedited premium services. So that that's basically faster uh, turnaround times or sort of transit times of, of vessels that are typically port to port. Uh, th these these sort of uh, service offerings use smaller vessels that can bypass any any of these big congested hubs. And also guarantee equipment such as containers, which is obviously crucial in a in a, in a market that uh, sees you know shortages of of uh, container equipment as well. And last but not least, um, you know what another lesson that we've also learned is that the COVID nineteen pandemic has really highlighted that events around the world um, can and likely will have an impact 
uh, on your supply chain. So it's really crucial to monitor disruptions, not only on a regional level uh, or on a local level, but, all, but really on a global scale along the entire supply chain from the supplier to the warehouse to the manufacturing side and the end customer. Uh, and it's really not important whether they, these events occur in the US, as we've mentioned before, such as the powerful winter storm in February, uh, whether it's you know in the EMEA region uh, with the Suez Canal closure, uh, or I could also name the cyber attack in, in South Africa on the port uh, that happened earlier this year, or whether they, they occur in Asia uh, with the COVID-19 outbreaks or the power crisis. Sort of all of them, all of these locations that are crucial in global supply chains really have faced disruptions in the, in the past 18 months and uh, and so will in the end impact impact your supply chain and knowing about these disruption uh, no matter where they occur as early as possible can provide you with a competitive advantage uh, to react faster than, than your competitors. So with that in mind uh, I would like to now focus on what companies can can actually do to build more resilient supply chains and and also talk about the trends that we are seeing amid the ongoing turmoil uh, that have sort of you know, really transpired in the last 18 months. So first, um, sort of investing in technology has been one of the key concerns really for companies in, in the past 18 months uh, or so, uh, especially given that the significance of any short-term disruptions uh, at key locations in your supply chain, as, we, as I've just mentioned, uh, whether they occur really on a supplier level, uh, at a warehouse or um, at, a, at a key sort of port or airport that you're using. Uh, the pandemic has really highlighted once again how paramount it is to invest in, in technology that can help you sort of monitor these critical locations and, and create greater awareness of your risks. Because obviously there's a lot going on, but you can't focus on everything. So that in case really something happens at, at those locations, you can react as fast as possible to, to activate, for example, contingency measures, internally that could you know include for example rerouting or, or expediting critical shipments uh, one of our customers uh, actually has has been hit by the, the growing congestion issues at at a key uh, container not, not container but um, airport air cargo gateway in europe frankfurt airport um, because they have been sort of flooded with uh, you know sort of inbound a lot of you know, huge inbound volumes uh, and at the same time have been hit by uh, sort of labor shortages with with covid 19 in recent weeks, or they also had a, a new IT system implementation. So uh, the, the congestion has only been growing at, at, at air cargo warehouses at Frankfurt Airport. So one of our customers, when they saw uh, sort of the disruption and the delays that were occurring, they decided to uh, use another alternative gateway um, and switch from Frankfurt to Brussels Airport uh, temporarily, sort of until the sort of the Frankfurt Airport backlog has been cleared up. And, uh, and to use that sort of Brussels uh, gateway into Southeast Asia for their critical shipments. And, and because that has worked rather well and Frankfurt Airport actually continues to be congested, they have made that temporary switch um, uh, permanent. So, so really their sort of investing in, in, in technology has really helped them to, to make a quick decision and then sort of, uh, sort of really modify their supply chain actually internally. Secondly, um, Another really key focus that has emerged uh, during the pandemic is, is sort of the, the impact or sort of the importance of multi-tier supply chains beyond the tier one level. So really COVID-19 has revealed that, that just knowing your direct uh, suppliers, so the tier ones, is often not enough uh, because a lot of the disruptions can occur at lower tier levels uh, of the supply chain. And, and once you find out about it, oftentimes because, because, because um, sort of that information has been passed on, from the tier three to the tier two to the tier one uh, that has sort of informed you in the end, uh, then it might already be too late uh, to react and, and mitigate any, any of the biggest uh, impacts. Uh, a study that we've actually conducted recently has shown that many companies are still in the dark when it comes to their sub tier suppliers beyond the tier one level. Uh, as you can see here on the, on the left-hand side, the percentage actually of companies knowing their supplier locations drops from 63% to 36% if you go down just one level from the tier one to the tier two. So about two thirds of the supplier uh, sort of respondents said that they would know about uh, the critical locations or the, all of the locations of the tier one level, but that really drops to only about one third uh, on the tier two level. And it obviously uh, goes down even, even, even uh, further uh, for the tier three or tier four levels. So that really highlights the point of, of uh, 
of the need of um, sort of greater transparency in the supply chain, because by knowing your sub-tier suppliers, you can potentially find out whether, for example, all of your tier ones may be sourcing from the same single source tier two supplier, which is obviously a, a situation that should be amended uh, rather sooner than later as part of a, a critical risk management effort. At the same time, um, some of your sub-tier suppliers uh, that you don't know you're sourcing from may be also targeted by specific uh, sanctions uh, or import bans that you don't know of because you don't know that you're sourcing from them. So that could really impact you when these shipments might be confined at the border or when you find yourself in, in violation of dealing with a sanctioned supplier. So there's really a growing trend that we see uh, that you know more and more countries want to crack down on things like forced labor, want to enforce uh, also sus sustainability in supply chains. Um, so, so really creating that trans extra transparency uh, in your supply chains is not only helpful for you to detect risks such as single sourcing, but really it will help you in the end to be more compliant when it comes to increasingly strict regulations uh, in, in certain countries such as uh, on forced labor or sustainability. And third, um, diversifying uh, supplier and manufacturing networks and also adjusting buffer stocks. That, that's really something that uh, we've seen more and more and that has really, that's a trend that has started obviously with uh, sort of the, the ongoing uh, sort of trade wars that, that started in, in January 2018 between the US mainly and, and China. Uh, but we've seen that really that companies that were able to leverage geographically diverse manufacturing or supplier sourcing footprints during the pandemic have actually managed to navigate the, the disruption uh, better. Um, bec because for example, if there's an outbreak, if there were outbreaks of COVID-19 you know, in a specific country, uh, and that sort of had an impact on, uh, on factories and, and sort of the, the, the output of the factories because of labor shortages, they could just increase production output elsewhere or just increase the source paths from other suppliers in a, in a country that's maybe not so affected by, by uh, an ongoing wave of, of infections of COVID-19. However, that really only worked to a certain point. Um, in, in the push away from China to Southeast Asia that, that I you know, just mentioned, um, obviously many companies have, have experienced a lot of disruption this year when Southeast Asia has actually been badly impacted by COVID-19. So that shift from China to Southeast Asia has actually been sort of reversed uh, because many companies were simply unable to, to receive deliveries from their suppliers, you know, whether they're based in Vietnam or Malaysia because of that really bad COVID-19 situation. And then were forced to go back to, to their uh, you know, initial suppliers in China uh, where they could source from or, or contract manufacture with. So that really shows that the challenges of, of supply chain modifications and diversifying networks and making that permanent, that's, that's really not something that's, that's possible within uh, 12 or 18 months, but it's really like a long-term long, long investment and, and obviously there will be uh, back and forth in the, in the meantime. So what we're also seeing is a, is a trend towards, um, towards more stockpiling of, of critical parts uh, to ensure that uh, you know, companies have enough um, sort of, sort of uh, supply available at hand in case of, of future disruptions of the kind that we are seeing at the moment. Um, we see that some industries uh, that have you know, heavily relied on just-in-time manufacturing, for example, such as the automotive industry, they're moving in a certain way to undo that model to some degree at the moment because of the, the ongoing material shortages, but also because of the logistics challenges. Um, they're doing that not obviously for, for all of the parts, but really more for the critical irreplaceable parts such as semiconductors, but also batteries. Um, we see we have seen some car makers uh, recently announced that they have uh, started to increase stockpiles of, of semiconductors, um, which they've never done before, uh, or started to build their own factories for critical parts such as batteries, or even lock up access to, to raw materials for these batteries, for example, by investing in, in mines, uh, as, as Tesla has done recently. So that could be something um, that is a trend to follow uh, and that we sort of uh, closely following. Um, whether other industries are sort of jumping on the, on the same train as well. So with these insights in, in mind on, on how companies are, are attempting to create more resilient supply chains in, in a post-pandemic world, uh, namely using technology, uh, but also creating more transparency on a supplier level, uh, as well as using a mix of diversified uh, supplier bases, but also more buffer stocks to be more agile and, and to react to future shocks, 
uh, yeah, I will conclude this presentation here and hand it over to, to Sam for the Q&A session. Marco, thank you so much for that, uh, for that presentation. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for a few questions, so we'll try and get through them. And if not, we can put some more into the Vigilant magazine as well. First of all, we wanted to know, can you elaborate on an example of how you've been able to help a customer avoid delivery delays or production downtime in the pandemic? Yeah, so that was actually um, one of the, the best examples uh, was very early on uh, for a, an auto component manufacturer that uh, had actually operations in Wuhan. Uh, sort of during the time uh, that uh, sort of the, the outbreak started in, in China, end of January 2020. And uh, and so they had this this multi, uh, so this really important project that uh, that they had to deliver engines for uh, or engine parts for. And so when they sort of got this initial notification from our system that, you know, there is a, an imminent lockdown uh, or shutdown of the entire city, they sort of, uh, you know, moved up orders and, and actually, you know, it was way, way too late to actually, you know, uh, shift shift the parts the usual way, uh, you know, maybe use an ocean freight. So they were looking for any kind of alternative uh, option to to route their their stuff into Europe, uh, and they had actually never used the tr this you know this China Europe train connection that I've been mentioning. There's the new Silk Route before, so they were like working with their uh, sort of uh, freight forward at this at the time to kind of secure capacity as much as they could, and sort of book everything on the on the next train uh, and and. Uh, uh, before actually the city would shut down, so so they would kind of moved all of these parts out of in, into the next train that was uh, next sort of train station that was sort of outside of Wuhan, from where um, the train then departed to kind of uh, you know sort of uh, you know really be able to secure enough supplies and sort of ship them to to Europe before you know basically Wuhan would not uh, would sort of uh, go go into lockdown mode for for a couple of weeks or months. So yeah, in that in that case they were really able to. To save you know, millions just because of that sort of one train, uh, and because they were able to react so fast and before everyone else. Yeah. And what are you advising customers in the context of the ongoing post um, post port congestions around the world? Yeah. So one of the thing that we're um, so obviously we are you know port congestion as I mentioned it's it's a it's a worldwide topic at the moment. So uh, it, it's really you know. On the one side, you, you want to have visibility on how you know delayed your ships are, or how, you know on average how long are they waiting, and how long is the the container maybe stuck in the port. So so one of our customers actually that is uh, sort of importing into Singapore, they were they were able to sort of reroute uh, you know some of their critical shipments into another port or sort of a discharge at another port that was less congested, and then sort of uh, truck truck the remaining um, the remaining. Uh, the remaining way into Singapore because Singapore also had had, a, had an outbreak recently and and so uh, they were unsure how badly congested the port would be, so they basically discharged at an alternative port. Uh, but also, actually, some of our customers they they have also went even further and they they sort of char chartered their own vessels. And uh, obviously, you can only do that with with a certain volume. But uh, yeah, with these sort of port congestion issues, you are, you have to. Uh, have sort of uh, original ideas, and and some of these uh, companies have actually yeah, charted their own vessels uh, to you know, to use smaller ports and and sort of not rely so much on on the on the market. I think we can try and squeeze one in, but I'm going to have to ask you to be very brief with your okay. answer. Nearshoring, reshoring, just in case stock levels, diversifying suppliers, and secondary sourcing points are now very much part of the conversation. But once capacity returns to the market. And costs stabilize. Will anything really change? Or, in your opinion, has there been a genuine, irreversible shift in the way companies are thinking about the resilience of their supply chains now? Mm, that's that's a really good one. I think um, what has definitely changed, and what's probably irreversible, is that you know, I mean, supply chain risk management or supply chain management is has you know really become a board topic. I mean, if you just see like the the latest you know earnings reports of of, of listed companies. Everyone is mentioning supply chain. I mean, it's it's a critical uh, thing now, and it's really evolved from a niche topic to a sort of bot bot uh, bot topic. So I don't think that will really change uh, anytime soon. And I think that even companies that have really not invested so much in in supply chain management or supply chain risk management because they were just simply able to pay more, you know, they were really not worried about costs or any kind of shortages. Uh, they have now they're now facing a situation where you know even if you're willing to pay. You can't get your goods from A to B, 
uh, or you know you can get your if your your powerful automakers you can get your you know so semiconductor chips um, because there's just not enough of them and so I think it it really there has been a shift uh, to towards a, a more holistic sort of approach to supply chain management and supply chain risk management because uh, you know doing it the way that it's, that it's been done before simply at, at this point doesn't work and you can throw just as much money at, at sort of uh, the providers or, or sup your suppliers as you want that will not sort of make the problem go away. Mirko, thank you so much for your very thought-provoking session and, and for your answers. Thank you so much. You're welcome.